I don't really read a lot of art books, unfortunately, but when I did read this one, which is just a really sort of simple universal art history that we've all seen dozens of, uh, I knew that I had to review it and talk a little bit about it. Another, this is another one of the books that I read several years ago, but ne never managed to make a review of when I first opened up this YouTube channel. So the writer is E.H. Uh, e. Gombrich, who is, um, was a pretty well-known art historian, and he wrote this book, which is apparently quite a bestseller, called The Story of Art. It says, the little sticker on the cover says, more or over 7 million copies sold. I can believe it. I mean, it's, it's a pretty accessible little thing. Not, well, not little. I should say not little. <laughs> it's, um, it's long. But a, a lot of it, of course, as you would expect, are just beautiful, full color representations of paintings. So, uh, about a dozen or so pages into the book, I knew that, um, it was, that this was a book that I wish I would have had more access to when I was first becoming a, I don't want to say a really serious student of art, but a more serious one who was taking art more seriously. Um, while in many respects it's a pretty conservative textbook, uh, it was first published in 1950, uh, it is fundamentally meant for someone who has little to no previous formal contact with art history as a practice. Um, of course, if you have some, this can make you seriously engage some of your previously held assumptions about periods or particular artists individually and why you like them or don't like them, but I got the distinct impression while reading it that it was meant to initiate um, a teenager, um, a teenager who very much reminded me of myself uh, into a whole new world of art and art history. The inclusions and the exclusions of certain artists are, of course, as they are in these histories, always arbitrary. However, Gombrich's choices don't deviate too much from what you would see in a standard uh, art history text. What particularly drew me to the book was what I thought to be its inordinate focus and I loved I mean that in the best sense of the word because I love this kind of art medieval and renaissance art um, of the 28 chapters included in the book about five mostly focus on western medieval images and another six focus on the art of the western renaissance so 11 of 28 chapters um, almost half of the book is devoted to medieval and Renaissance art, which I love. Most surveys of art history, um, which I've seen in the past, sort of pay scant attention to medieval art, and they sometimes don't give Renaissance art the space that it really deserves. So there's uh, no doubt the medieval and Renaissance art are sort of Gombrich's pet subjects here, pet periods. What makes this book so wonderful is that instead of spending the first chapter in sort of an abstract exercise of thinking about what art with a capital A is, he forces you over and over again to take the art on its own terms, to take each individual sculpture or painting or fresco or whatever it might happen to be on its own terms. While discussing the various visual perspectives painted by the artist of the Garden of Nebamon, he says this. Um, and let me see if I can actually find that painting for you. Yes, it's right here. Thirty-four. Yeah. So this is a, I just want to hold it nicely up close. You can see it's this sort of woodland scene. And in the middle, there's this lake with animals in it. And um, I'll just read you the description of, of it. It's a wall painting from a tomb in Thebes um, from around the year 1400 B.C. So here's what he has to say about that painting. To us, reliefs 
and wall paintings provide an extraordinarily vivid picture of life as it was lived in Egypt thousands of years ago. And yet, looking at them for the first time, one may find them rather bewildering. The reason is that the Egyptian painters had a very different way from ours of representing real life. Perhaps this is connected with the different purpose their paintings had to serve. What mattered most was not prettiness, but completeness. It was the artist's task to, pres to preserve everything as clearly and permanently as possible, so they did not set out to sketch nature as it appeared to them from any fortuitous angle. And um, that's, you know, I mean, looking at that, that uh that piece you can tell that you know obviously there was no such thing as um as sort of like uh, uh anything like we're used to in say post medieval western art right it's no there's no sense of perspective there's no background and foreground uh the 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 lake sort of looks like a swimming pool that's just a rectangle in the middle of the... I mean, it's very weird. But he has this interesting idea of explaining why that is. And you can agree or disagree with it. But um, it's an interesting idea to think about. That they weren't after about um, any sense of... Um, you know, and I don't really know if I, if I buy that they weren't after prettiness. I'm sure they were. Because it's a, a pretty pleasing image to look at in the first place. But um, maybe that wasn't their focus. It's something interesting to think about. So it's uh, it's sort of insights like that and things that give you pause to think about that make this book really worthwhile for someone who might be wholly new to art history. And after all, how many of us have measured something we saw by the standards of our particular narrow time and place. Oh, well, you know, that doesn't look like anything, you know, I would ever draw. <laughs> how much, how much can it be worth? How much can it, how pretty can it possibly be? Um, and the questions that he raises really pull you out of that sort of insularity and uh, provincialism, which I think is something that all, you know, uh, high school slash college students really need in you know, both aesthetic sense and, and a lot of other senses. So he really drives home the point that thinking about art seriously means thinking about other perspectives, both literally and figuratively, other uh, preoccupations, other aesthetic modus operandi. Uh, and this is, you know, something that all of us, uh, even adults, not high school, college students, but adults can really uh, learn from and, and take away from. So if you want a really great solid history uh, to art from Thebes to 20th century, The History of Art by E.M. Gombrich. E.H. Gombrich, excuse me.